You're watching The Honeydew with Ryan Sickler at your mom's house. Welcome back to the Honeydew, y'all. I'm Ryan Sickler. We're over here at Studio Jeans doing it at your mom's house. Uh, let's see. You can find me on all social media at Ryan Sickler. And uh, ryansickler.com is the website. My new album, Get a Hold of Yourselves Out, wherever you get. I see, keep saying new. I don't know how long you're allowed to say new. It was November. Is it still new? If you had a kid, it'd be new, I guess. So it's fucking new. Go get it wherever uh, music is available. Uh, dates. This weekend, Phoenix, House of Comedy. I'm going to be out there in Phoenix. Uh, that's the 4th through the 6th. April 26th and 27th, I'm in Vegas. May 16th through the 18th, Edmonton. Coming to Edmonton. Finally locked it in for you, Canada. Passport's still in the mail, so we'll see if I'm really coming. Um, and then June 13th through 15th, I am with Tom Segura. Over there to my left. Richmond, Maryland, and Atlantic City. Um, and then Tulsa, Wichita, and Kansas City. I got to look at this because I can't remember it all. And then August is House of Comedy. Um, as you can see, we now have video here at your mom's house for the Honeydew. Um, subscribe to the Your Mom's House YouTube channel. Download, subscribe to the podcast, all that stuff. Oh, yeah, merch. I had to turn the page to even tell you what I'm wearing. You guys have been asking me for merch. So merch is available. Go to the honeydewpodcast.com hoodies t-shirts some stickers starting easy you know what i'm saying we'll see how excited you guys are about it um email me at honeydewpodcast at gmail.com follow the show on social media facebook is the honeydew podcast twitter at honeydew pod and i want to say to all the crab feast fans yes we are taking the feed and, and creating it's or all the episodes and creating its own feed so just be patient you will get them all everywhere for free i promise you that that's coming um so you know what we're doing over here at the honeydew we're laughing uh at the dark times the hard times the not so fun times but uh these are the stories behind the storytellers and today my honeydew is a crab feast favorite it's got the best goddamn ghost story i've ever fucking heard in my life <laughs> got the best goddamn podcast i've ever heard in my fucking life ladies and gentlemen please welcome to the honeydew Keystone Karen <laughs> Kilgariff, everybody. Thank you. I'm proud to be here. That what a, what an introduction. Well, I'm sorry to make you sit through all that. I always feel weird about that. Look, People just sitting over here while you're sitting there saying all that stuff. And plugging yourself the yeah. whole time. While somebody's you, sitting to your right. You didn't even try to reference me in no, any way. I didn't. Whatever. I didn't even try Good to luck get on you. those road dates, right? <laughs> 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 uh, thank you so much for being here. I'm very excited to sit down with you. But before we get into it, will you please let everybody know whatever you want them to know about you, Karen Kilgariff, where they can find you, social media, not that they don't already know. You know they, so. Well, I'm just on Twitter at Karen Kilgariff. Um, I left Facebook in, a, in a huff. Uh, what do you in mean the, in a huff? In the, I just had a realization. I think it was um, 2011. And we were all sitting in a writer's room and everyone was talking about all the weird things that they had been experiencing on Twitter, or, or I mean, Facebook, or the bad things, the fighting, the whatever. And I just was listening to everyone complain, but knowing that no one was gonna get actually get off it, they were just complaining. And I just opened my computer and hit delete. Right there. Yes, I just did it knowing, and I also, it was because I was recently divorced. So I knew I was going to get myself in trouble on Facebook. I knew I was gonna do something that I didn't realize was wrong until like someone else told me they saw it or something. Like, in, like what? What was your biggest fear? Like, <laughs> like <laughs> I, well, I have a problem. I think it might be like a comedian thing, but especially with texting and stuff, I just will never stop texting. I will just keep on riffing jokes. And that's kind of my favorite way of communicating. So like, if someone answers me, I'll just keep on answering. And it took me working with like 23 year olds for them to be like, no, don't do that. Like, stop answering. The younger generation. You have to time. stop first. And I was like, what? It's hilarious. I'm being so funny. Like things like that, that are like subtleties of current, like, digital interaction that as a person from like the 80s i just don't get and don't kind of believe in so i'm like maybe i just stay away from this and then just on twitter i do my jokes 
And yeah, then, you crush on your fucking. Uh, <laughs> if this plane goes down, <laughs> it's my favorite fucking thing to read on Twitter. Isn't it that really so how you good. feel though? Yeah. It's right as a, like, oh a, my god! Like, there's just a moment where you go, "This could be it," and you just have to like, "What if I just have one last thing to say?" You have really good. Remember me as someone who <laughs> it just makes me fucking laugh so hard. They're really good, and I'm also like, "God damn, she is flying again." Yes. Yeah, I know you're everywhere right now. You know what's funny? Uh, and this is not a good way to start a podcast. This is a great way to start a podcast. No, that was great. <laughs> oh, what you're about what to I'm do. What I'm about to do. <laughs> it's just that like we just recorded our podcast at home last night, but coming off of four days on the road, back to back with four the weekend for four days on the road. I, I'm i so sick of the sound of my own voice. Like I'm so sick of talking. And I, I honestly only have like eight stories that I just kind of like rehash in different ways. <laughs> like everything about it, it's just like, how long can you do this? How long can you guest on podcasts before people are like, we heard this already. <laughs> Stop telling that fucking ghost story. I heard that goddamn ghost <laughs> story five times, Keisto. Come on, man. <laughs> you Start drinking life. again. <laughs> live a life. Um, I know what you I, I know exactly what you mean. Even with um dating or meeting new people or anything like that, like you're always telling your story. You just get so sick of yourself. Yes. Like, oh, this happened and this happened. <laughs> Go listen to podcast episode. <laughs> if you're still, that's what you should do. Listen to this if you're still interested. But do you ever I'll go back and listen coffee. and like you think there's podcasts that you're like, I came off great. And then you go and re-listen and you're just like, I have that thing where just everything is like, shut up. That's everything I do. I like, want her to shut, shut up, up so bad. Why do people listen to this asshole? <laughs> Like then you try to you try to listen to things as people you were like oh if it was someone you would like like what if they listen to this and then you're like oh my god start and negative commenting on your own Facebook <laughs> and shit <laughs> I could have done better guys I could have you know what I should have said there <laughs> I should have shut up is what I should have done there yeah um, it's getting a little uh, you know so let's really dig in it's, all right <laughs> let, let's let's have me talk a bunch. Is there what it, dates, anything else you want to say, promote before we do that? Because just get it all out. The one thing I would promote, but I don't want to, I don't want to start a crosstown rivalry. Let's I don't want to Jets and Sharks it, but we did start our own podcast network. You don't want a West Side Story to start? I mean, we could, because I'm a good dancer. Are but. you a Jet or a Shark? Well, who are the ones that got down really low? I don't know, but I'm just going to claim Sharks since you didn't know. You okay, guys are fine. Jets now. Jets are You're cool. You're Jets. All right. I want to be with Rita Moreno at all in all cases. I get it. Um, <laughs> in every way. Um, what was I trying to Your tell network. you? Your network. That's right. Yeah. We Cross have a podcast rivals. network also. Yes. Um, it's called Exactly Right. And that's where my podcast, My Favorite Murder is, and my podcast, Do You Need a Ride, is with Chris Fairbanks. Um, I love that you still do that. It's so fun. I love that you do that. It's really fun. You should do it. I'll do it. I'm getting ready to go out of town on a few dates. Okay, good. Yeah, we'll get you or we'll, we'll pick you up or we'll drop you off. Whatever and I want to say thank you, too, because you heard the first episode of this, which blew me away. I didn't even know why you listened or anything, <laughs> to be honest. And then you went out to. We're friends, right? <laughs> I mean, like, are we friends? Yes. Am I course. wrong about no. that? No. <laughs> uh, but I was so just taken aback. Like people started hitting me up like I'm here from my favorite murder. And I went and listened and I was like, holy crap. So. Yeah, thank you so much. I know you were laughing at us shitting on uh, my mom and Steven uh, Tyler and stuff. but It uh, was because <laughs> here's here's the thing. I, I love the idea of it. And I really love um, the fact that you sit on the microphone and are like, this is a really fucked up thing that happened to me. And this is how I feel about it. And this is how I don't know how I feel about it. I think that in and of itself is a very brave thing to do. But I also think that men never do it and never are encouraged to do it so like to sit there and be like here's this fucked up thing and like actually be honest about it and of course laugh about it but also be really really exposed and vulnerable is a really cool good thing to do man thank you i hadn't even looked at it like that i hadn't yeah. looked at it as the sex thing you know what i mean i just feels right so i didn't look at it as guys because i do i've been to a bunch of therapy and i do know there a lot of the therapists will say like I don't get many of you. Like a lot of you guys are resistant to this. So it's good that you're even here as a positive step. And I'm like, yeah, yeah wait to hear what I got to fucking talk about. That later. <laughs> don't, don't. Uh, what's my blessings. copay? What is my copay? <laughs> you're going to uh, want to up that copay a little bit for what I'm about to do to you. But I mean, I just think it's the thing. It's, it's not that uh, 
I didn't mean it to be so, it's not like divisive as much as it is like, the more people that do it, the more people will do it. It's not that big of a deal. I've already gotten a lot of emails about people that are like, thank you so much. I, I, I just reached out to a therapist. I'm going to therapy for my first time because they're hearing all these other people's stories. Even me, I mean, I know my story was fucked up, but when I hear Tim Dillon and Jessa Reed and the shit you're about to tell me, I'm like, <laughs> what am I bitching about? Yes. Um, but the other thing that makes me really appreciate comedians even more is that we are people and people like us, not just comedians, but there are people out there that obviously um, this resonates with them. But instead of just bawling up and crying or or turning to addiction or whatever it is, we process it with like, I'm going to cry, but then I'm, we're going to fucking figure out a way to laugh at this shit because that's all we know how to fucking do. It's all we know how to do about everything. Is quote Aerosmith lyrics as you're <laughs> saying, my mother hated me. <laughs> Oh, shit. It was, I mean, yeah, that yeah. was, that was a commercial for itself right there. Well, it's just like, they're doing it. You really helped <laughs> a lot. I mean, I know, you know, your reach. So I, I can't say I'm very humbled and thank you very much. Uh, my pleasure. Um, So where do you want to so start? Let's never talk about that again. Keystone. Um, well, I don't know, because like you're saying, Anytime I look back over like the span of my life, I always feel like anything I would want to talk about is like small potatoes. So you, I have that thing, especially like the stories people tell on this podcast, on similar podcasts, where people are like, I was born in Death Valley alone and I crawled out, you know, crawled out. <laughs> signed myself up for kindergarten where you're just like, oh, I was, I was basically carried all my life until I was 18 years old. Um, so you, you know, there's always that comparative thing that makes me feel like, Ooh, don't talk about that. I hear you, but this show is not just about, you know, uh, being abandoned as a kid or a rough upbringing. Uh, Jeff Danish had a great episode of just humiliating moment after humiliating moment. It's, you know, it's any of those times you've been an underdog, you know, embarrassed, humiliated, <laughs> not just abandoned abused you right, know right. so it's anything then i felt the same way about myself like good <laughs> god you know these people <laughs> like holy shit <laughs> i grew up without parents that's it you know what i mean like, i didn't want to get into this kind of stuff with you i thought i specified i have heard some shit already in 13 weeks where i'm like what the fuck i know are like, you, you want to go like about? how are you here yeah when i could barely like scrape my way out of state school i didn't i flunked out but i mean like you know i just it's not it's i marvel at some people's like fortitude because yeah i never knew how spoiled i was until i was like in los angeles in the real world with people um who had not didn't have their parents standing behind them going what's she gonna do next their whole life yeah so but even within that i think everybody is the way they are for a reason. So it's kind of interesting to look back over your life and then be like, yeah, if maybe this was slightly adjusted. It could have been a little bit easier or better or uh, whatever. And so my thing is, I just, the relationship I a have- A well-placed hug, you know, <laughs> a well-timed, hey, good job. Hey, how about someone picking you up after <laughs> school like once a I'm week? I'm not even asking for that. I can get the bus. How about a motherfucking hug? <laughs> Do they hug on the bus? You don't want that. No, you don't want any hugging that's, on the bus. That's that the a bad. hug-free zone. Well, I mean, we had to, like, that just immediately puts me in, because we lived five miles out of town in Petaluma, California. So it was kind of country. I, lo I was just up there. I love it. It's the best. I, okay, I'm sorry, but <laughs> this is also a super weird thing. Yes. You know what I'm going to say? Yes. You text me one night, this January, mm -hmm. that you're in Baltimore doing shows. And I respond that, holy shit, you're in Baltimore doing shows. I'm in Petaluma right now doing shows. Yes. It was the weirdest fucking thing. It was and so weird. And that's how this got born. That's right. This whole podcast, this podcast network. Mm -hmm. The um, whole network was because of that. That's yeah. right. <laughs> you're welcome, Tom Segura. Um, what camera do I say you're welcome, Tom any Segura? Any of these. <laughs> any of these. Right here. He'll see them all. He's like in some weird room behind that wall. Um. Well, because we are given constantly, people bring us presents at the live shows all the time. And often uh, they will bring us candy. It'll, they'll go like, this is the oldest, best candy store in our town. 
um, which I'm like, please, you're killing me. Like, I love it. It's the best, but it's killing me because there's nothing better than after like a long show and you you go post up in a hotel room, like forensic files and just eating salted a caramels until yeah. you fall asleep. It's disgusting. So um, there were there was this box of candy and we had a bunch of other stuff. But I was like, this looks like legit because it was old fashioned um, the gold writing, the gold script on the mm -hmm. front. And when I got into my hotel room and it was like, <laughs> like the old widow up in bed with her feather boa around her eating chocolates. <laughs> and I bit into one. I was like, what? This was like, it was the craziest, best. I think it was salted caramels. The, and so I texted you the picture of the box and was like, do you know this candy store? Because this is insanely good. And then you were kind of like, yeah. And then you were like, hey, by the way, I'm in your hometown. And then it's just fucking weird to be in Baltimore and Petaluma at the same time. Crazy. That's crazy. Um, and did you know they're on the exact same latitude? Is that for real? <laughs> no. Oh. <laughs> Wouldn't that be amazing? We're both in 92 North latitude. Oh my God. There's a, <laughs> there is a sign when you leave ocean city, Maryland, which is the East, the, you know, the eastest of the coast. Um, and it'll tell you Sacramento. I think it's got a Sacramento distance. And a couple of the, San Francisco, maybe, you know, for how far it is. But that's why I wondered if that was legit. Well, I think it is kind of it's probably across. Close. It's probably close. We should get out the uh, the laser. Let's bring up the TV, guys. <laughs> can you? Can we get a laser pointer? Can we out Google here? Map up here? <laughs> um, so Petaluma, that's where we are. We begin in Petaluma. We begin in Petaluma, California. Um, Oh, I was telling you, we used to walk home from school up this street that no like six year old would be allowed to walk this distance today. I can't believe how far home we walked and alone. And it was out in the country, so no cars would go by. But then when they did, they would go by at 90 miles an hour. <laughs> so the likelihood of you being struck and wounded if not mortally, you're was done. like so high. Yeah, you're done. All you had to do was be kind of not paying attention and you would just get hit by a And are these the two ramp. lane, double yellow, no shoulder, just grass on yes. the side? Ditch, grass ditches. Ditch. And are you guys walking in the fields or are you walking along the road? Along the road okay. with no sidewalks. No, yeah, the, where the asphalt just crumbles down into the ditch. Where, the, where your body will land. Where, where yeah. a body will right. land and rot <laughs> and never be discovered. Never be seen, yeah. <laughs> um, and there was weird people walking on the road. Every once in a while, there'd just be a weird person on the other side where you'd be like, don't look over there. <laughs> just like, it's just so odd. You, were, you had a solid two hours where you were, oh, I should say I was truly fending for myself. You're sometimes, six years old. Yeah, well, yeah, basically. because First we would, grade. That's first first grade. grade, yeah. And my sister would walk sometimes with me, but if she did something else, it was just like, well, then you get yourself home. How, how was the age difference? Two years. She's eight. Still, even an eight-year-old doing that. I know. I Third know. and first grade. Crazy. Are you walking with other kids too? It's most of the time, but it how just many? depended. Like three max, and I would say. All elementary school kids. Yes. And little packs and going up. it took up. two hours? Well, no, nah, that's One an exaggeration, hour. but in an, an hour. I that's mean, a, it was like, it was definitely a mile, if not more. And it was one long. Was that's season four of true crime right there on HBO. <laughs> really? That's how it starts. It seriously is. There's like, hey, wait, why is there a witch symbol on my back? <laughs> oh, I'm dead. Great. That's actually the Cadillac hood <laughs> symbol right there. I hit her at 90, put her in that ditch over there. But I own this ranch, so you're not going to arrest me. That's right. It's like yeah. country yeah. law. Um, but I mean, yeah, like, so they just repaved that road. So the road I'm thinking of that comes up immediately is Middle Two Rock Road. And it was the exact same, like, the patch, the asphalt patch vein, black veins that would come in like this, that, where they've never repaved it. And just the last time I was home in Petaluma, my sister goes, hey, you want to see something? And takes a left on Middle Two Rock, and they've repaved the entire thing. It's like... It's almost like a got a bike path. Now. It's yes, it's like the driveway to a rich person's house, and I'm just like, oh my god, we were screaming as we drove up it because I, I knew every strip of right. that street, and now it's just like, it's it's the smoothest silk. So, did that, you do that for all five years, all through elementary school? So we had carpool in the morning and it was so it was basically like we'd get driven in the morning, but then after school it was like if somebody had softball or somebody had some kind of project like everyone would kind of get split up and then 
or 4-H or whatever. You would just kind of go, you would get yourself to the next thing. Or my cousin, my heroin addict cousin Lisa would show up in her Chevy Super Sport that was jacked up in the back, blasting Stevie Nicks. <laughs> and she would sometimes- Karen! In the middle of my room. Karen, over here! It's all right, it's all right. Come in, Lisa. Come Needles in. are in the trunk. Come on, I won't embarrass you. <laughs> Seriously. It was... So so basically what happened was I grew up next door to my Aunt Jean and Uncle Steve. They were not blood relatives. They were our next door neighbors and my parents' like best friends. They had a ranch. So they had um, they had like a couple horses and then they had uh, sheep and some cows, chickens, geese. Um, that sounds more like a farm. It was a farm. Yeah. Yeah, ranch is not uh, accurate. I'm lying. I'm lying about the size uh, of their ranch. I, I God damn it. I asked you not to come on here and lie about ranches and farms. And I want to talk about, about my lying problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, they called it the ranch. That's why I called it that. Got it. It was definitely a farm. But we did 4-H. So like we like we did chickens and, and sheep and raised sheep and stuff for 4-H. Did you so, have FFA? Yeah, we didn't. At FFA your high school was for, eventually? Yes. Yeah, they had it had at the schools. We had it too. We had yeah. it. But that was kind of for like kids whose parents owned real ranches that were going to go into that, like farming mm -hmm. as a as a job. It seemed like 4-H was more like, do you want to learn sewing? Do you want to ride a horse or whatever? It was kind of just stuff for farm kids to do. Um, but anyway, so yeah, it was just like, so my dad was a fireman in San Francisco. My mom was a oh, okay. a nurse, a psychiatric um, nurse. So they both worked during the day when my dad was in the city at work but the, sometimes my dad was home so like he would if he was there he would pick us up um uh and then he would make us go do chores with him <laughs> like go do he always was trying to get us to go to yard birds the hardware store with him um which we never wanted to do um but my mom worked all the time so when he was at work we would go to my aunt jean and uncle steve's and just like hang out um on the farm and fuck around and so like there were times where my sister just wouldn't she just wanted to be by herself or wasn't talking to me or whatever so i would just walk through fields for like four hours by yourself yeah just walk around or like walk with sheep or whatever <laughs> walk walk near the horse for a while but it was just like you just had to kill time and um they would only let us watch tv for like a certain amount of time so it was like from five o'clock on or seven o'clock on or something and that's what's the real tragedy here <laughs> 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 Fucking 120 minutes of screen time, man. You believe that bullshit? I just Jim. milked three cats. I can't watch eight is enough. I, I earned that Tom and Jerry, <laughs> you sons of bitches. I want to watch Flipper. They had I Flipper. I used to love Flipper. Flipper was m like majestic. That was mm -hmm. my favorite show. Yeah, that was a great show. Like stuff would happen and then a dolphin would show up to help. That's the. They should totally reboot Flipper. I think they did have a movie that came out. Not too long ago, it was Flipper. Did it do well in the box office? Did you know about it? No, probably not. Probably <laughs> it was not. like it was just a kids' movie. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I was gonna say I was a walker too. Oh yeah. And I'm blown away. You're right. That would never happen today. We walked. I'd say probably a mile. We walked um, from sixth through eighth grade. So older, a little older. But we would always gather a couple people on the way. You know what I mean? Like yeah. this, our buddy Chris Lamb lived halfway, so we'd get him and then we'd all go. But it was like, I loved it because it was always walkers are dismissed first. They were the oh. first people to be let go out of the school. Everybody else is waiting for buses. You would sit there and they'd be like, bus 88's here. And if that was your bus, you'd get on that bus. But we were always first to bounce. So all the kids that lived, even though you didn't hang out with all of them, all of them are there first. And we used to have a vice principal that would drive around and make sure no one was fighting and all that. She had a Cadillac and he would roll through the neighborhood <laughs> and regulate really? all the walkers. Yeah, all the walkers. <laughs> so there weren't like turf wars with the walkers or anything? There were no Jets and Sharks shit going on. <laughs> None of that shit. That's just right here, girl. <laughs> That's right here. But you're right. I, I'm amazed at like the shit that it's not, it's not that long ago. No. But you would never, not only would you never, you'd be arrested if you let your six-year-old walk one hour by themselves to get home. Absolutely. Even 30 minutes, you'd be probably arrested. Yes. Yeah. There was, that happened to a woman who was like trying to let her, like her 
where you live no 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 i, oh. I just remember reading an article i think it was like new york new york or new york state or something a, a woman that was letting her like fifth grader walk to school and people like rose up and were like reported her to child services because she was letting her child walk <laughs> meanwhile we were like we would we would on the weekends would set up lemonade stands and like attract all kinds of weirdos because it was like the late 70s yeah so there would be like people rolling up that were no they looked like they were playing a part in like, like a their TV audition. movie of the week yeah where it's like hey i'm scumbag number three we're like what's up do you need Action. lemonade <laughs> And they're just walking up to your weird ass lemonade stand, all no shirt, leather vest. What? What? You, rem you, ever, you remember that? Oh yeah, because my cousin Lisa, she hung out with these people that were like, "Okay, this is one of my favorites." Listen, if they ask for pink lemonade, let me take that. All right, that's how. <laughs> that's, that's a special. That's a special thing I got going on for my age. <laughs> Pour a little age into it. Cuts the it cuts <laughs> the, the bite. It cuts it. We were in. <laughs> drive home carpool one time with this family the benedettis who are like the who the Med the benedettis the benedettis and okay. they ran they actually it's funny because they were just like another family down the street but their their dairy clover stornetta is now like the fancy milk at whole foods oh yeah so it's like the star of my hometown but it's milk <laughs> I was like, I'll see it in movies, like or on in TV shows, like on the table. It's just a Clover Stornetta thing because it's fancy, non homogenized. It's the Benedetti's like, milk. Yeah. Wow. That's my carpool milk. That's your. You were in their carpool. Huh? That's my dairy. That's were my they, home dairy. Were they had they started it when you were? Yeah, it was like a family okay. business. Yeah. So they'd been doing it for a while, but then it took. They they got rid of all like the hormones and stuff. They were like the first people to be like, our cows just eat grass. Come and get some of this. Yeah. And it worked. But and you were like, I'm gonna go to way a Keystone. Like you should be fucking with our vitamin D, man. <laughs> it's Benedetti's. Yeah, like, have you guys heard of beer? You you should get into the <laughs> beer business. It's so much better than milk. Um, <laughs> so they were driving us home one time, and we had to go to my aunt Jean's house because my um, dad was at work and my mom was at work, and we got dropped off. And as Anne Benedetti was pulling her her Dodge K car station wagon into my aunt Jean's driveway, <laughs> K station wagon, which yeah. was who just said this? Someone said those cars. I think it's Vin Vince Averill. Those cars were exactly as if a third grade boy designed it. It's just like a perfect rectangle yep. sitting on top of each other. Um, so we pull in and my cousin Lisa's standing, they're all standing around her Chevy Super Sport, like talking about the tires or whatever, or siphoning gas. I don't know what the fuck they're doing. <laughs> they're <laughs> siphoning gas. <laughs> don't drink it, just huff it. That's how you get high, all right? Just look, there was definitely hoses involved. Um, and they, the group of people standing by her car were dressed and looked and had the vibe to the point where Marcus, poor Marcus Benedetti, who was at the time maybe in first grade or younger, jumps up from the back seat and goes, mom, drive away, the bad guys are here, <laughs> and screamed it at the top of his lungs. And of course, Ann Benedetti, the bad, guy. <laughs> the bad guys are here. And his mom was mortified, she goes, Marcus, that's Karen and Laura's uh, cousin or whatever. And we're, and my sister, who at the time was like in sixth grade, goes, no, Anne, he's right. And then we <laughs> just got out of the car. <laughs> the bad guys truly are here. Thanks for the chocolate milk. <laughs> Childhood's over Hilarious. for us. Yeah. So they looked every bit the part you would think that some high school, was she high school at that point or college? She was called, well, she was out of high school. College. Yeah crew that she'd run with yeah. driving those cars doing those drugs listening they, yeah to they were what mac would yes. look like That's it was like perfect. towny towny but a little worse she had found the kind of outer edges of like that drug culture but she was getting away with it so like my aunt jean <laughs> my aunt jean saying one time she just like snapped on all of us like we were all playing cards all the cousins in the front room having fun and then she just fucking threw it down and stormed out and we're all just sitting there like holy shit and my aunt Jean goes, her, her long hair makes her hot. What? My aunt tried to say that because Lisa had long hair, it made her hot. And that's why she was like in a bad mood all the time. And we're like, we think it's the speed. <laughs> that's our theory. Of, you know, I know I'm only eight or whatever. Lisa said you but... didn't call Uno. So <laughs> she is fucking pissed. Like, you sure it's not the speed, Lisa? Karen, if you only have one card and you don't call Uno, Lisa will storm out. She'll storm out. She's, she's going to go 19. sit in her car. <laughs> yes. She's going to go smoke. <laughs> and listen to Fleetwood. Three Rock. cigarettes at one time. So 
it was a little bit like that where we were kind of like my dad my dad at this point has actually said to my sister and i yeah we screwed a couple things up because a they couple just, things, yeah. they kind of like trusted it was just like sure let lisa drive you to 4-h so like lisa <laughs> she's all fucking real. punching it yeah for real no like, car seats <laughs> none of that. you know how in high yeah. school how in high school boys get their license and they get a car and then their big thing is like if they come pick you up they're gonna drive 90 back mm -hmm. down the street i literally would just be like is this, is this it? Like, th this is nothing. Because my cousin Lisa was, she one time we were driving to, she was driving me to. Um, Wait, you mean you were unimpressed with the guys? Yes. Because of. Because they thought you were going to be like, <laughs> stop it and scream and do a bunch of shit. And I was just like. My cousin Lisa gets on two wheels right here, right here. <laughs> Get ready to hydroplane. Literally, <coughs> Lisa would drive 90. I mean, then that's what kind of everyone did out in the country. It's just like everyone just there's no cost it was that you said a monte carlo s it was like that black chevy, one a chevy super sport oh chevy super sport okay with the midnight blue um custom paint job i had to hear about it so much i could she i could love that car huh? yeah she did or someone did and gave it to her but she was driving me to 4-h one time and it had just been raining and we were going close to 100 miles an hour down thompson lane oh which is just like you just one old person getting the mail and it's over and we hit a puddle and hydroplaned and spun in her car easily 10 times are you serious like spun where i was just like oh this is it i mean i was like oh oh okay this is all i got and the car stops and, and we're Lisa's just like, like Woo! Yeah. and she no she turns to me and goes don't you ever tell anybody <laughs> immediately <laughs> But if you do, you make sure you tell them I fucking pulled out of this like a goddamn pro. <laughs> they were going the right direction. We're going to four H. So yeah, I was like, yeah, my our our lives were constantly threatened, but in a very low key, the way I'm not allowed to complain about. But yeah, but it exactly. was a truth. It was like my cousin Stevie was a total lunatic, and he would beat us up constantly. So he would make up games. He was, was younger. He's the Lisa's brother? Yes. Okay. He was the youngest in their family. And, and how are they cousins? Who's? No relation. Oh, this is the neighbor. I got it. Neighbors. Got it. Got so it. our moms were best friends. Right. And we basically and uncles, had kids. to spend. Yeah. We had to spend every day, every other dinner, every vacation, every holiday with them. Oh, it was like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people thought my mom and my aunt Jean were sisters because they kind of looked alike. But it was just that like, yeah. We just cycle together. <laughs> and I don't mean bikes. We don't. <laughs> Get in that red tan, everybody. Um, <laughs> uh, what was I gonna tell you? Um, Stevie. Yes, okay, so my cousin Stevie was a psychotic, violent, angry boy who- What's going on at that house? A lot, I yeah. think. Well, also I think it was, they had the, they had the real 70s like kid experience where it was very much like, you might as well have smoked yourself because you inhaled so much cigarette yeah. smoke. I remember getting going to the gas station and my mom telling the guy through the window like, $10 of ethyl or whatever the fuck, rolling up the window and lighting up a cigarette. In the car? In the car at the gas station. And I remember watching her light the match and being like, I love the smell of matches. <laughs> being like, and gas together. And gas together, I love death. Um, so my cousin Stevie was, like the bratty young one in his family, but then the oldest of obviously me and my sister. So he was kind of stuck with us a lot. Um, and he uh, liked to make up games like we could play baseball because we were just bored. We were bored out of our minds. So he'd be like, I'll play baseball with you, but you guys have to play it normal. And I, the way I tag you is I just throw the ball at you. <laughs> like stuff like and that. you're only like, out <laughs> if I hit you in the face. <laughs> yes, okay. For real. So we'd be like, okay, because it was like, or we just sit here. So we're like, fine, I'm just don't get hit by the baseball. But we of course would like, I'm sure that oh. I have broken ribs in the back <laughs> from that motherfucker. I'll bet. And we talk about it every, so he now, he and my sister um, are like, see each other. Every... Well, I know you're not Facebook friends. <laughs> <laughs> I deleted him first, then got rid of my account. <laughs> Stevie, <laughs> you're Facebook. Out. We give him so much shit too, cause he's, they, you know, we're, we couldn't be closer now and all, you know, all of their, his two daughters and my sister's um, daughter and my niece all grew up together. And it's like, it's really beautiful. They're that all like, nice. yeah. they have their own family, but 
we just I we love to be like remember that time where you thought my sister threw an egg at him so my aunt Tina had a compost pile um that was just you know it's the organic stuff that breaks down so they would take stuff out of the kitchen to be like old whatever gar compost pile and on top of it perfectly were two rotten eggs like two eggs that she had thrown out um and we were I think it was either that very violent version of baseball or some game he had gotten us to play and cheated was a dick and basically it was just like it broke down into him figuring out a way to slap us in the face and running away or whatever and my sister like he threw her into the compost pile and so just as like a last act of rebellion she kind of reaches over and sees this oh, egg yeah. and just hucks it and hits him perfectly in the back of the head <laughs> with a rotten egg and we ran for the rest of the afternoon we just ran just away from him from all all afternoon it was like you could there was nowhere to hide it was like it was in, insane and it was like it was like i was never scared of bullying at school because the second i got home like the biggest most insane bully who sometimes would be like, hey, what's going on? I learned wrestling today. Come here, I'm gonna show you wrestling moves. And then just like- It's called a sleeper hole. Seriously, <laughs> yeah. it just just gets slammed in the teeth. Like you're like, can't we just you're watch like, our dudes? And you're like, no, we have God to practice damn. this wrestling thing and just get slammed on the ground. It's called a pile driver. <laughs> watch your neck. <sighs> yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. And also? <laughs> well. This is what I wanted to ask you about. Mm. So you talked about, you said your parents now say, yeah, we fucked up a little bit. What was your relationship with your mom like? So it was good, but she, my mom had two alcoholic parents and was an only child growing up. So okay. her childhood was like full chaos all the time. And basically, and her father died when she was 20, I think. Very mysterious circumstances they think in some kind of a bar fight. Like he was a very terrible alcoholic who would get sober and like clean up and start a new life every three years. So she, they would keep going like, here we are, we made it, everything's fine. And then he would of course fall off the wagon and he would lose his job and he'd have to move again. So by the time my mom was in high school, she was completely self-sufficient. And she was just like, don't need anybody I'm doing it all myself. Um, and went to nursing school. And I, it was the day she was supposed to take her test to for to become a registered nurse she found out her father had died oh man and she doesn't remember taking the test and she passed it and became a nurse so she doesn't even remember taking it no wow she said it was just like yeah and then she basically kind of became my grandmother's caretaker because my grandma was kind of just a drunk along with her husband and suddenly now that like she didn't have anybody and so she was super dependent on my mom um, I loved my grandma though. She was the greatest, Grandma Grace. She was like the queen of, she's the one that, um, she was a, a, a flapper in the 20s. Oh, yeah. Like she actually kind of lived that life. So she had all those weird sayings that didn't make sense. Like if you walked by and you're wearing a red shirt, she'd go, red attracts. You're like, I'm, I'm attracts, five. Attracts what, Grandma? I'm five years old. Attracts what? Grandma, Toys? no. Toys? Grandma, no. Predators? What Horses? <laughs> Stevie? Red attracts? Or yella yella catch a fella, or you'd be like grandma. No, um, I think these are just rhymes, not <laughs> any real truth to them, grandma. No, I mean, yeah, you can't live by them. Um, but she was fun, and she was like, she was good. She was a good time, grandma. She was also obsessed with Lawrence Welk and Merv Griffin. So like, that's we were kind of reared on when she she developed um, Alzheimer's and couldn't live by herself when I was like eight or nine. So she came to live with us then. So we would like hang out with her after school. And, uh, um, but her and her and my mom always had kind of a contentious relationship because they had just basically it was the two of them, you know? Um, so I, yeah, I fought with my mom a lot cause I think I watched her fight with her mom a lot and kind of figured that was the interaction. Like that was the best way to get really like concentrated direct attention. Right. Because other than that, our parents were very much like the thing they'd always say is it's adult time. You guys go in the other room. It's adult time. So you kind of like, I think I learned early to just to be a problem and then you could have all the attention you wanted. So I did stuff like I lit the bed on fire. Wait, what? Um, you lit your bed on fire? I lit my grandma's bed on fire. <laughs> smart. Yeah. A lot smarter Not than my your own. Yeah. <laughs> I was just like walking around the house and my mom was on a long distance. How call. old are you? Like five. 
So you got a lot going on here. We have, you're five years <laughs> old. We've got long distance calls, which don't even exist anymore. Don't exist. Yeah. We've got the, the um, yellow phone, like the maze yellow phone. Yellow, that my yellow, mom catch was on. a fella. <laughs> Mom trying to get on the horn. She's now. on. Um, green, green, you know what I mean? <laughs> liar, liar, but set that bed on fire. You better shut the fuck up, grandma. <laughs> grandma, you don't know me. Uh, so my mom's on this call and I'm just, you know, just trying to, uh, make my way in the world as a five-year-old I find matches in the bedroom so I'm like amazing I've seen people use these so I start lighting matches holding them until they burn my fingers and dropping them on the bed and of course it's 1975 so everything on that bed is like is made of different versions of kindling I mean like it's yeah, all right. it's all as flammable <laughs> as it possibly could be with an extra coating of chemical flame um, not retardant, but like encourager. Combustible. A combustible situation. It's a combustible comforter set. It's, it's for yeah. Christmas. <laughs> because like that was back when they had uh, fucking, remember um, it, uh, heating blankets? Yeah, I had one. I love them. We that. all had them. They were the best. Electric blankets. Electric blankets. Yeah, yeah. The best. But I mean, like, there's no way those didn't give people cancer. There's no way. Oh, I didn't think about that. I was th always thinking about the fires and just zapping your energy. Because I always <laughs> did feel tired the next day. <laughs> just an electric cord laying all over you all night. Like, oh, why am I so tired? <laughs> people thought. <laughs> Got 12 <laughs> hours of sleep, man. I'm exhausted. It's drawing energy from you. Let me take it off of eight and put it down to three. It never dawned on me to take it off. I need to get it out of the Florida area and turn it down. Into, Florida. Into more of <laughs> the lowlands. the Texas panhandle. All right. Um, yeah, so it was, it was a, a, um, an electric blanket was the top layer. It was like powder blue. And mm -hmm. so I was just like kind of watching the matches go. And then sometimes they would land and start a little fire. And I'd be like, ooh, and then it would go out. And I did that for enough time that I then started a fire. And then so I realized it wasn't going out. And so I walked out of my grandma's room and down the hall and down into the kitchen. And my mom was like talking the phone. I'm like, it's a mom, it's, it's a problem. And she literally was like, did this like, and then just turned around and got 65 a minute right <laughs> this is before 10 10 to 20. <laughs> this shit is expensive get out of here so i was dismissed easily three times three times meanwhile it's just like growing like this and finally she's like i was like it's i there's a fire on the bed and that's and then she could smell it and went back and put it out which was nothing compared to very soon after that when i had seen on little house on the prairie when Nellie Olson faking her own paralysis. Do you remember that? There's she, there's <laughs> one little house on the prairie that I remember. I, I remember the show, but specifically in it. The you, rape one? Yes, yes. It scared the fuck out of me. If I remember correctly, in my mind, what I remember was a girl being attacked by some weird dude in like a, almost like a priest outfit, like this long flowing uh, gownish thing with, with a mask, mask, right? Yes. Oh man, mm -hmm. I, that one fucking stuck with me. I'm so glad you know what I'm talking about. Cause yes. I've, I've said that to other people and they're like, I don't know what your problem is. And you, do you remember that it turned out it was the girl's own fucking father? I don't remember that. It, that episode should never have happened. It should not it have been aired. It was her dad? Yes. Every, they did rape they did incest they did it all child marriage because remember albert was going to marry her because she was pregnant from that attack that was like the create i had to God, handle that storyline kept going Ye well no, no no but that all happened in that episode oh all in the same episode <laughs> yeah holy shit they were wrapped it all up huh? and i'm like in third grade like okay uh what do we who do I talk to about this? I mean, yeah, who do you, your parents aren't going to tell you what's going on. They there. were nowhere near. Uh, you mean the rape incest <laughs> episode? Yeah, let's sit down and talk about it. That's two hard topics we got to discuss with our toddlers. <laughs> Fuck you, little house on the prairie. They're like, why don't you just keep it to like rubella or whatever the <laughs> yeah, shit right. is that you normally Chicken, do? smallpox, man. <laughs> Albert's got the smallpox. The was, corn is was tainted. Blind. Was he blind? Was Albert blind? Mary, the older sister, oh, the was, sister blind. was blind. Yeah. Yes. And we used to do, um, when we would be shopping with my mom and board, we used to do, we would pretend I was blind. You would? Me and my sister. So my sister would lead me around and I would try to pretend like real subtle, not like a lot of people to overplay it where you're oh, looking yeah. all over. You don't have to do that. Mm -mm. Keep it small. Keep it small and just look a weird direction. 
that was <laughs> and people would be like go ahead little girl and go we ahead, thought it girl. was the greatest thing ever that is hilarious my sister guy as if that's how the setup's gonna be that they're just gonna oh her older sister will guide her around this That'll girl's be two years older with sight <laughs> is gonna go ahead and she'll be in charge at and, mervin's, and, <laughs> at mervin's. <laughs> but so that was a you know that whole show affected us but the one that uh, that really got me was um, I can't remember if it was for attention or whatever, but Nellie Olson pretended she was paralyzed. And she actually had Laura pushing her around in a wheelchair. And at the point where Laura realizes she's faking it, she goes up to the, she pushes her to the top of the hill and then pushes her down the hill and she goes into the pond. Damn. And that was the big hilarious ending. Because she stood up and was not paralyzed. It would have been different if she right. really was. So I woke up one morning and like, that would be great. I'm going to do that too. So I just yelled, I can't feel my legs. How old are you? Five or six. I mean, like, so young. so young. It's creepy. Creepy. I can't feel my leg. <laughs> that is, if I heard my daughter scream that, I would be fucking tearing ass up those right? steps. Yeah. Tearing all my muscles. Yes. I'm not even warmed up yet. It's just a cold sprint up the steps. Like, what? And it's my mom and my grandma standing over me. And my mom's doing all these, like, medical things. Like, can you feel this? But they did that in the episode. So I was like, nope. And I knew just don't don't flinch and don't react to anything. But then they started getting so upset that I was like, I can't, I can't feel my legs. It's okay. And then my mom fucking lost her <laughs> mind. She lost her mind. And my you grandma was, seriously. <laughs> my grandma was like, no, no, leave her alone. My grandma had to like throw her body across me because my mom wanted to strangle. I'm gonna cover your torso. Your legs are shot to shit, girl. Let's save what works. <laughs> Pull your knees up. Pull your knees up. So Ball up. Get to Ball up. God damn it. Come on, Keisto. <laughs> um, and I would say that that like me, that's me and my mom's relationship my okay. whole life, where I was trying to get her. I think I was trying to get her attention. My sister has a theory because. When I was two, my mom gave birth to our younger brother and who died a week later. Oh no. And then she basically had postpartum for like six, eight months after that. I was two years old. So all of a sudden, like my mom was gone and I didn't have a mom for a stint of time that like comparatively isn't that big of a deal. And she was in the house, but like she wasn't, I couldn't be around her. Right. And it was, so, I think that did, I think like in retrospect, I think it n encouraged in me a thing that was already kind of there because I have a bit of a like insane feralness to me. And I think it just was that thing of like, well then fine then. If I'm on my own, I'm fucking on my own. And <laughs> so, so it would be things like that or, you know, but the family story that everyone loved is that for a long time in like past toddler into like, you know, threes and fours, my big thing was anywhere we would end up, it would be like a family party, um, you know, holiday party, whatever. We would arrive and I would walk in the door and in within minutes, my dress and clothes would be off and I'd be running in the backyard naked. At and other people's house? Yo, yeah, yeah. Anywhere, just like once we got there, I would just be like this and run, and my mom would just be like, get someone, get her. Like I did it all the time. I did it my first day of school in kindergarten. At school? At school. Because the teacher said we did finger painting and then the teacher said go, because um, we, you had to wear smocks like mm -hmm. over your clothes. So she said, go, go take off your smock. And I was just like, sounds great. Like it's time. And then I just went. Well, I stopped booked there. Booked it around the, the playground naked. Naked. It, it oh, was, you went outside, not just in the classroom? You were outside? Oh, out, outside. <laughs> I didn't want to be inside naked. It was all about running outside. <laughs> that is hilarious. Yes. And it was, she was like mortified. And I think it was also like a way, like instinctually, you know, that thing you do where you know, if you do this thing, you're going to get this rise out of somebody that's hard to get a rise out of. I think it's like why we become comedians because you start to get addicted to that oh, like power to say addicted to that yeah. yeah so i knew i could get her because she was all about kind of like being really cool and having it all together and being you know in charge and so i was just kind of i think i kind of lived to freak her out a little bit um which i did uh all the time <laughs> but then of course when i got older when i was a teenager it it got bad it was it really got bad. worse like what well, because I mean, you're starting with setting a bed on fire. That's a, yeah. that's a you got you set the bar pretty high. At I five. mean, and I knew I could do. It. I knew I could cross that bar time and again because essentially, by the time I was a freshman in high school, I was drinking, 
um, I have an active interest in it always. My dad once found just a just an unopened Miller Lite in my nightstand drawer when I was like in seventh grade. He was like, <laughs> what the hell is this? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm practicing hoarding beer. He was so mad, but like I hadn't done anything except for taking this Miller Lite and just stuck it in a drawer. But it was like, they knew it was, you know. It was on deck. Yeah, yeah. it was foreshadowing for sure. Yeah. Of all the beer I would be hoarding I'm inside make one of myself. those beer can airplanes, Dad. Don't worry <laughs> about it. I'm going to dump this out. I like the label, Dad. Um, yeah, so then it just became, it was just a constant, uh, it's just constant fighting, constant power struggle, and constant, like, I couldn't have her tell me anything. Um, and that was just, she. that's what she would always say. It's just like, oh, you can't. I can't tell you anything. <laughs> oh, you know everything. And I'd be like, yes, I know everything. I believed that I did. Uh, but I was also kind of bitter that she wasn't like, she wasn't a regular mom like everybody else's mom. Like even other people's moms who worked still were like, and I'm at all your school activities and I'm at all, I made you a outfit for this thing or. So she wasn't, she wasn't at the sports or any, anything you guys did outside the home. She was not there. No, not really. I mean, she would show up if she could, or like if it was a play, she would be at like the first one. But there were those people who's like, her, my mom's in the front row every night and she made all the costumes and all that kind of participation shit. And your cousin's out there. Like, mm, <laughs> mm, we go on extra innings. God damn it. Mm. He's sitting in the back <laughs> picking his nails with a like a switchblade just waiting for me to walk off stage switchblade. the second i walk off stage for this production of oliver i'm dead meat uh, oh, in the middle of it they're running in the back like camera out front when you're done like, god damn man we're in the middle to play but it's like we um when i was in sixth grade me and my friend holly saw in the newspaper that there was going to be auditions for oliver from the Pedluma. Um, the like the town, the municipal like arts thing was called the Harmoniers and Harmonettes. So the Harmoniers and Harmonettes were were putting on auditions for Oliver, and we saw it in the newspaper, and we we're like, let's do this thing. So we just walked down and auditioned by ourselves. We didn't ask anybody. We didn't tell anybody we were going. Like at that point in sixth grade, we're like, well, if we don't do it, we won't be able to get right. there. No one's gonna drive us, so we have to go do it. And we did that. Showed up like signed up there was no permission slips or anything you just were like i want to be in this play sign up and there were kids from our school which was the catholic school in town and then there was two other public schools so it was like all the kids that were interested in musical theater were there they fucking call my name first i had to audition first in front of everybody of anybody ever auditioning for anything you're and, the first audition yeah ever the first anything and I just remember hearing my name and then it was just that thing of like, well, I guess I have to do this now. Like I walked all the way down here and it was our big idea. And like, I'll never, I can still see it in my mind of like getting up and walking up that aisle and all the kids are just like staring at you. <laughs> like you're, you know, like, oh, there she goes. And uh, you had to sing along with Where Is Love, which is like the Oliver solo. So basically to prove that you could hear the piano, like that you weren't tone deaf. And then I think I a cappella saying like tomorrow from Annie or something like That's that. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. But you basically had to prove that you could right. carry a tune or whatever. Um, and then you just went and sat down. They didn't tell you anything at the time. They were they and how called many, everybody. How many people would you say were there? I'd say 30 or 40 kids That's a long audition. time, Especially if you're first. That's a long time to wait to be done. Yeah. Yeah. But I was at that point so relieved. I was like, it's it was like one of those early lessons of... Um, being really scared, but not having, nobody's going to drive me home. Like nobody's going to take me out no, of that walking. room. That was <laughs> <laughs> put my little stick in my bindle and get the fuck out at five o'clock. Listen I mean, guys, the train's coming by at five, man. I got a, I got a hobo at I got a, Anybody got a can of beans? Oh, don't worry about it. I'll find my own. <laughs> no, I'll take care of the fire. Don't worry about that. I was a child hobo. I really was. Oh my God. So yeah, it was that, it, I think it forced me, like I know the reason why people take very good and close care of their children now, but there's a couple situations where I look back and go, I don't think I could do any of the things I do now if I hadn't kind of been forced into these independent situations where it's like, okay, you can either quit or you can do it and you're scared, but you still have to do it kind of thing. 
So in a way it's good, but I was very bitter about it at the time because I just wanted like a Marion Cunningham style mom that was like right. always sitting Norma there. Arnold for me, Wonder Years mom. Yes. But yeah, you went happy days, but I hear you. Yeah. Yeah, and right? am I older than you? No, we're same age. Oh. I'm 46. You just, you like that. You like, the, you like blonde. You like the blonde mom. I just liked her. Like the, the it still stands out. No, it's, I, it's funny. I don't, I, 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 I guess I don't not like it. Beautiful is beautiful. <laughs> but the one that stood out to me was when she held up the tidy whities and goes, Kevin, I got you new underpants. You know, just humiliate. Like I did not have a mom. Like I, like I said, we didn't get hugs. You know what I mean? <laughs> Definitely weren't getting underpants. Yes. And I was just like, she bought him underpants. And that was it for me. And always like, but there were always those moms that knew us in the neighborhood and they always were those moms to us because I feel like they f felt sorry for us and they were good moms. So you could go over anyone's house and get a sandwich or swim or hang out and get that. Yes. You just weren't getting that at home, you know? Yes. And, and I, I bet it's like, sorry is a part of it, but I also bet they loved you and yeah. they wanted to make no, sure that did, you were like, sure. you You're know, right. there's that, that mom thing is like when they get it going, there's plenty yeah. to go around, yep. like, you know? I'm not going to shoot another one out, but I'll come on in here. I got <laughs> you hugs get in for here. days. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think the same people. thing, though. Like, if my father hadn't died, if that hadn't happened with my mom, I don't know that I'd be sitting here talking to you. I don't know. It's hard to gauge what it, if you're, we say doers, if you're a doer, if, if you're a person that got up and went after it, it's hard to gauge what the hardship, taking that away, how it would have affected you. You know, would, right. would, you, would you be the same person? Maybe, maybe you'd be the same person, but I don't think I would, no. um, you know, and I, I think about like, um, my stepson's about to turn 16 in July. And I think about like where I was at 16. I'm like, Matt, you know, no parents taking care of yourself, looking after your younger brother. Um, so I agree. It's, it's, it takes years to figure that out though. That's the thing, you know, can I ask? A, qu a kind of a dumb question but like if you were taking care of your brothers what did you make for food okay so we constantly had we would get twenty dollars a week that was our allowance and that came from because my dad we were all minors when he passed so there was some kind of something from his work a check that came but my mom knew and she took a po box out so that we couldn't get the money so she would just give us $20 and we got, and he, and my, so I got 20, my twin brother got 20, my younger brother got 10. He, he, we were driving was the reason we got extra for gas. Money. Okay. Cause we were driving them to school and ourselves <laughs> to everywhere driving to and live. going to get yourself underpants. Yes. Underpants. Yes. So we, um, we always just ordered pizza from a place called American pizza. Like they knew who we were. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll bring it, we'll bring it over Ryan. Mm. Like it was every day, but it was always. And back then, McDonald's had flipped it uh, to their old like '50s prices or whatever. So cheeseburgers were, I think, hamburgers were seriously like twenty nine and thirty nine cents for yeah. a while. So we we're just eating shit, just shit, yeah, just crap. We could go to the grocery store and you know grab and microwave that kind of stuff. We were big into because we um, were often just home, you know, from like three thirty till seven mm -hmm. when it, when my dad was at the firehouse. And we would make, my sister got into making all the different things you could make with Bisquick. God, see, we never did anything like that. That's, well, maybe it was, it's not good to use the oven as a kid. I don't think you're just at home. <laughs> I mean, we would make pizzas and stuff, but we never got culinary crazy in there. You know, Hold peanut on. butter and jellies and the, shit. You might be sad to learn that you don't have to get culinary crazy because Bisquick is literally Bisquick and water or sometimes an egg or sometimes <laughs> oil. It's just like the combination of those three things and you could fucking make anything. And put like whatever ingredients you want in it. Sure, you could have a savory biscuit. <laughs> you could have a sweet one. It was hilarious. They sponsor this podcast, Bisquick. I don't know if you know that. Bisquick for abandoned children. <laughs> <laughs> biscuits for abandoned children we would just sit there and eat biscuits like we were manual oh, laborers when we hilarious. did nothing all day <laughs> fucking watching star trek and eating bisquick <clears throat> and it's, also powdered lemonade i was obsessed with it we had kool-aid we were big on kool-aid oh yeah yeah but we called it cherry juice but it was always kool-aid <laughs> give me that cherry juice and then my brother, I'd be like, stop drinking out of the fucking pitcher. He's like, I'm not. And he's, and he's got the fucking cherry juice mustache. And she's like, 
I can tell you're fucking drinking out of the pitcher, you fucking idiot. Pull a Dixie cup. That's it. Like, that's why I hung yeah. that thing on the but wall. But then at night, I'd be out there doing the same fucking thing. Like, if y'all were doing it, I know you ain't listening. <laughs> so much spit in that pitcher. Oh, God. Did it have a lid? It was the, it was, you'll remember this probably. It was the yellow catch a fellow Tupperware pitcher with the white top and it had the little gray push button and it was yes. sort of like uh, ridged underneath and you pushed it in and yes. it didn't work that great. That's the one we had. We had mustard yellow. Did it have an like an in, indented flower pattern in gold? This one was just solid. Okay. Yeah. But it was a, we were that pitcher. <laughs> yeah. You guys had a couple more dollars. To <laughs> Upper middle class. We had flowers. I... Um, <laughs> I think about that a lot too. You mentioned like how we treat our kids differently now. And um, a few years ago, my younger brother got married and he did a destination wedding in Jamaica and a handful of us went and it's all guys we've known since. And that was a good thing about sports, like since sixth grade, you know, they're all, we're all coming and we're all hanging out and they all have their wives and stuff. And um, their wives are awesome and they're great moms and they're all sitting around talking about the shit they do with their kids <laughs> and they're doing it for a while, you know, and like, and we made up this game and we go here for the summer and we'll do this for that. And my brother and I are just looking at each other. My younger brother's off doing his wedding shit. This is the night before the wedding. And my brother and I look at each other and he <laughs> goes, he goes, remember when mom used to hug us? And I was like, he goes, no, he goes, you remember when mom used to play games with us? And I go, nope. I go, remember when mom used to hug us? He goes, nope. And we kept going back and forth on all their shit. Oh, basic love. Like, remember when mom used to make dinner? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, we go on, a, we're going on a cruise for her 13th birthday. <laughs> I'm like, do you remember that mom time mom told you she was proud of you? No. Nope. We just, every time they do one, we do one. <laughs> well, I, I remember being really jealous. My sister's best friend, Adrian, who's like my other older sister, because she was always around. When she started having kids and those kids were in grammar school and like getting older. And she'd be like, well, I have to go pick Connor up for practice. And then I have to drop off Johnny, but whatever. And I would just be seething with jealousy. Of, of like 12 year olds and I was in my 30s and I just would be sitting there like livid and I'm like oh yeah because every time we ever wanted to go anywhere if my dad was home he'd go no he'd, no. Say, he'd say it like <laughs> he'd say it like I walked up and said dad could I shoot a gun at you right yeah like it was that always like what <laughs> roller skating like how dare you that's a good way to get out of shit you don't say another <laughs> word <laughs> Just like everything is beyond, you're asking beyond like, anyone's oh wildest dreams. Oh my God. He, and sometimes he'd go, why don't you get a paper route? Or just be like. I Do something more dangerous that'll get you out by cars <laughs> and away from me, God damn it. That's what I wanted to ask you. We've talked about your mom, but what was your relationship with your dad like? Was he uh, just, did he keep his distance? What was that? No, no, no. <laughs> my dad was like, he was. Um, cause he grew up with eight brothers and sisters, huge Irish Catholic family, very, all of them very involved with each other. Um, so he was great. I mean, both of my parents are great. I don't want to say it like he was great and she wasn't, she just had to work harder to be a more momish mom. Cause she didn't have it. So she didn't know it. She was, it was like a cool cocktailer from the sixties came and raised me. So it was just that thing of like, Oh, Karen, okay, don't do it. <laughs> There was a lot of that That's where you're just like, yeah, can I have yeah. a, how about you help me out? Tell me how to do it. Walk me through it once and oh I'll be okay. But God. it was always like, oh, that's, mm -mm. you know, smoking off on the side, which was good for later. Like then but I was had, she the disciplinary, like when you're doing all this shit for attention and getting in trouble, is your dad weighing in too? Or was he just like, you deal with that shit? Um, they couldn't deal with me. I think there was like, they would try to do it. We would get yelled at. I would get yelled at but I didn't care. There was something about it where I just kind of was like, it was, I was very um, defiant. I mean, I think I was very defiant and also just kind of like, I also didn't, um, a lot of times when I was in trouble, I did not see it coming. I was always surprised like that I lit the bed on fire. The, like those things I never put together was right. like, eventually this bed's gonna start burning and people are gonna get mad at you. Never came into mind at the beginning of Let's Play With Matches. That just, um, so my father had more of the, he couldn't believe I was the way I was. So he's very stern and he always talked like, he's always like that, but he, it, I was so used to it that it wasn't scary or intimidating. It didn't curb my behavior in any way because it was just his 
like normal talking voice. Like my friends used to always say, if people called me after school my, and my dad answered the phone, cause he'd be like, hello. He answered like, he, that's how loud he is all the time. And then I'd get on the phone and my friend would be like, sorry, are you in trouble? I'd be like, no, what are you talking about? And they just, from just the, my dad's normal talking voice, everyone thought I was in trouble all the time. So it was, there was a sternness that then like, if my dad gave you a certain look, it you would stop dead in your tracks. And they didn't like ever hit us or. That's what I that's what I have with my daughter now. Yeah. I got I got a look and she just knows. I'm yes. Like, mm, that's all. We're, it's done. Yes. And that's the way to do it because then you've basically parented like, then you set a boundary and you've kept it. And that they were very good about stuff. It's like also that. public friendly. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? That look says like you fucking do that shit one more motherfucker die. Yes. Mm -hmm. It keeps everything. My parents were very um, uh, like self-aware of not looking like poor people because I think that was like their number one fear. You don't raise your voice in public. You don't, you know, like you don't fight in public. You don't do anything. I wouldn't like... have a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> if everybody abided by those rules, your never gonna listen to this episode. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, there, it was that. I don't know. They put they they instilled it early and in a way that like I think was best for raising children generally, but then could have been dialed back a little bit. Just like, yeah, I want to go fucking roller skating. I'm nine years old. Drive me over there. This is not unreasonable. Like you were always kind of being treated like um, it was the depression or something. You know what I mean? Like people were, you know, I, it's weird. And I actually have talked to my dad about it later. Because he said when he was growing up, if he went home after school and laid on the couch, my grandma would come in and just scream until he got off the couch. Like they did have their own um, family paper route. They did have jobs as kids and they all had to contribute because they were poor and there was, you know, nine kids and that was kind of like standard. So it's like my dad just never adjusted his approach um, to like, the current times are his own children or the fact that yeah we didn't need to there was there weren't a bunch of mouths to feed so we could have taken it easy maybe a little bit um but then it also was like they they were like that but then later on when like we were in high school and when i started drinking and stuff they just had this kind of like they, well i have a theory because they were kind of hands off and then for a while, they just kind of weren't around. They were taking a shit ton of cruises and like going on a lot of vacations. But they were going together. So they were. Yes. OK. Yeah. They were happily married. <clears throat> all all my mom died um, in 2016. So they were. Yeah, they were happily married up until she got bad um, with Alzheimer's. But they I think what happened is my because my grandmother died of Alzheimer's, the one that lived with us. Oh, man. And I think my mom knew because it's hereditary and it's through the mother. And so I think she knew it was coming. And I think she had a kind of very conscious, like, let's do everything we want to do and never look back. And sure, we have a high school student and uh, a 19 year old living at home, but you know, so they would be gone and we would have, of course, huge parties oh, and yeah. just do whatever we wanted. Um, it was a little insane. My senior year in high school, I didn't go to school that much. I don't know how to, how I graduated from high school because I don't remember reading any books. I don't remember doing homework at all. Like I don't, there was, I remember typing up, um, I typing up like a British lit report about the, the poem Christabel um, that was, that I said I would do. And my, my teacher goes, you read it and you want to pick Christabel? And I was like, yep, loved it. It's great. She's like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah, not paying it. Not you said Kristen Bell, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do a Veronica Mars paper that is going to blow doors. No, Kristen Bell, and it is a 30 page poem. And I, she gave me four different outs of, to admit that I was lying and didn't read the poem. But I was like, girl, I've got this. And she was like, God bless. So it was, there was a lot of that, um, be, just being on my own, being being at home and just being like, like I, I uh, applied for college by myself, filled out all the paperwork by myself, turned it in because my parents were just not there because they were on vacation. But at, so at the time I was bitter and the time I was kind of like, well, fuck everything, then I'll do what I want. In retrospect, I think it was my parents like getting their last, you know, like living their glory days basically right, yeah. before anything changed. 
Um, and then it did. So, you know. How long after that? Um, like, do you think maybe your mom was starting to see glimpses of it or was it, was it a straight up preemptive thing? Uh, I think she was starting to see glimpses of it because um, my grandmother died when at 71 with it. And my mom, uh, I think she had it, she had it early onset for sure, but I think she was getting signs of it in like her late fifties. Okay. Um, and then it really came on strong when she was like 63 or 62 or 63, where it was like, and it was, I wasn't home because I was in LA and working in TV and never went home, like only on holidays. And the first time I went home and it was, you know, at this point they'd had a solid decade, um, of, of us traveling. being out of the house and yeah. yeah. And just doing, you know, being a retired fireman, like that that's all firemen do is then figure out ways to hang out with each other even more than after they work together. So there was always like a golf trip or some kind of, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> there seemed to be a lot of cruises in my opinion. Um, but yeah, so I went home for a holiday and I think we'd all thought a lot about it privately but never talked about it because we just knew that was a possibility um and i remember coming home one time and my mom saying the same thing within a three minute period saying the same thing 10 times and it being this thing where no one else was acknowledging it no one everyone was acting like nothing was happening and by the end of that trip home so it was probably about a week i pulled my dad aside and said i need to talk to you and basically confronted him and said, she's got it and it's happening and it's time to stop pretending that it's happening, not and happening. He was just in denial. Yeah. But I mean, the second I said it, you know, it, he broke and was like, you're right. We got into a fight, of course, first, because there always has to be yelling in our family. But yeah, but then he was like, you're right, you're right. And I'm like, look, I haven't been here. I know this is like, I'm sure you're pissed that I'm saying this, but as the outsider coming in, like- That's we're, really big of you. Well, yeah, but also- it's your mom. It's my mom. Yeah. And the change in her was so drastic because it truly was like, she was a lot like, uh, did you watch Mad Men? No. Um, it's one of the few I haven't watched. You have to watch it. It's so good. It's so good. But she was basically just like the really cool composed. She was the advice nurse at Kaiser for years. She was the person you called and be like, oh, my thing is bleeding. And she'd be like, put ice on it. It's fine. Don't, you know what I mean? She was <laughs> yeah. that person always. Hang on a second. My daughter set the bed on fire. <laughs> Karen, just put some ice and some bacitracin on it. I'll talk to you. And she's like, Karen, put some ice and some bacitracin on that, please. <laughs> yeah. So she was like the queen of handling it. Mm -hmm. So little things came up before that, before the repetition started. And they were these weird outbursts. And the people that were around were my cousin Stevie and my aunt Jean, and his mom. His died dad his dad died when I was twelve, which was like the first big hard thing. And then but it kind of like bound our family together even more. So it was like some holiday and we were all in the kitchen and my mom was um, you know, getting everything ready for like family to be over. I feel like it was Easter. And she put like a thing of that like nacho cheese in a glass jar, you know. Uh, no, sh my cousin Stevie put it in the microwave to heat it up because like for appetizers and she started screaming at him like everybody, it, everybody went like no and she was like, you can't put that in there and he's like, Aunt Pat, Aunt Pat, look, it's glass, it's whatever and she was like super upset and like really angry and really and then she kind of didn't know where she was for a second and every you could tell everyone in the room just got like cold chills and then didn't look at each other and didn't talk about it. And it was like little things like that that kept getting like, laced. Stevie, where the fuck's that cheese, man? <laughs> Shit. That Everyone's it's like, a microwave for Christ's sake. It's almost springtime. Are we going to do this nacho Easter cheese <laughs> thing or not? Nacho Easter cheese. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh. So the, you knew, the indicators were there for a long time. But then when the repetition started, it was just like, this is bad. I've dealt with it with a few uh, friends and, and family. And um, I remember it, it's, it was a great movie. You don't know Jack. You ever mm -hmm. seen that on HBO? The Pacino does. Um, oh, come on. Mercy Killings. Oh, Kevorkian. Kevorkian. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, and did, they used, I didn't see that. It's Sorry. so good. And, the, and it, it may be too much for you, but 
they use real they intercut with real footage of the interviews and stuff with the people and there was one that just again like uh norma arnold's i bought you underpants that stood out was um it's a woman who says she went in her backyard and she said that for 15 minutes she didn't know where she was and she told her husband once it gets to you know a half hour an hour i'm it's time for me like I, if i don't know where i am for an hour like it's time and then it, you know she gets to the point where she doesn't even know who anyone is and then yeah so. yeah well and no no i mean the thing is like she my mom would say that too and she would say it jokingly and she would be like push me out on an ice flow she had all these really <laughs> good she, polar bear me seriously <laughs> cigarette she didn't smoke anymore but she always had her fingers like this it was that attitude you know what i mean of like oh yeah. it's a little drag queeny um <laughs> but but when it came to that time where it would be like i we knew that that's what she would want mm -hmm. you it doesn't matter what that person wants because it's all the other people that are having to deal in right. the day to day and that was actually one of my favorite conversations i ever had with my sister because when my sister and i when we were going through this we were having it bad because i was down in la basically not there for any of the bad shit. then i would come home and freak out because it was like coming home and being in the middle of a terrible play where you're just like what in the fuck is this like unrecognizable family situation whereas this was like that was i would invite people to our house for holidays that was like the kind of setup my parents had and suddenly it was just like my mom <laughs> i said this to somebody it was like my mom was B, the b arthur of of the situation yeah. all my life and suddenly she became betty white and you were just like what the fuck like that's not your personality. Suddenly she was like real airy and she'd be like, oh, I saw those birds again. And you'd be like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. And this isn't my actual mom. It's right. like a weird, um, there, there's somebody in her place that I don't recognize and I don't like and I don't want to be around. And yeah, so that, it just increased. And my sister and I would, it would be really hard because we both wanted to like blame and attack each other and, of course, that's what you always do in a family. It's always like whoever's closest. And there was one time where I had to stay with her. It was the first time I really experienced how bad she had gotten. And I stayed with her all day. And uh, when my sister came to pick me up, and it was like all day, I mean like five hours probably. I was, it was awful. I mean, it was just like insanity. And I was crying and going crazy. And my sister's just sitting there like letting me cry in her car. And then I was like, it was so bad, Laura. You don't understand. Like she fucking is with her every day. She understood. But I, I go, I'm not kidding. I was, I was thinking of killing her. And my what? sister goes, just like putting her out of yeah, her misery. I understand. Yeah. And my sister goes, so at the time there were um, commercials on all the time for, um, what's that fuck it? There's one medicine and one of the warnings was, if you have Alzheimer's, it could kill you. It was in the commercial. Is that the Chantix smoking one, maybe? It could have been that a thing Chantix. Had, I only guess Chantix, because that thing has like 500 side effects. I know. <laughs> yeah. It seems like they all do now. But there was one that like specifically mentions, do, you can't give this to Alzheimer's patients, it could kill them. It says it right there. Let's say it's Chantix. Okay. So my sister goes, I Spon say that. Go. I just lost the sponsorship, guys. What about, do you want to take that say right <laughs> out of your two fingers? Chantix. Um... I'm crying, right? And I'm like, oh, I'm not kidding. I want to kill her. I want, I want her to be dead. And my, my sister goes, are you, you don't think I've had a Chantix moment? Yeah, right. And she's like, <laughs> I want to kill her every time I go over there. It would be great. That would be perfect. And then like, she starts laughing and then I'm just crying because you want to fucking barf because you're like, what? Like your whole, um, everything about our whole families and our whole lives and everything changed entirely. All the people that used to- In a to second. In a second, yeah, like people start disappearing. Nobody comes over. Uh, it's it's so fucking dark. And then nobody like, and you just kind of have to keep going because, you know, and, and my father did not want to put her in a home. It, he waited for so long for like, I mean, she had it for 12 years and she was only in a home for the last three maybe. Mm -hmm. So she was at home- It's a long time. Forever. Years. It was awful. It was really, it was bad. And then it was hard because when I first got into therapy, it was when I was working on a daily television show, high pressure, high stress. And I was there like, 
Well, my mom has Alzheimer's. I don't want to talk about that. Um, I just want to talk about my job and like get my job all figured out because I couldn't even talk about her. Like I couldn't because on top of the fact that we had lost her in this really undignified kind of like, you know, horrible way. I still had all these problems with her. Like I, there was all these fights that I could have brought up immediately to be, be like, well, we need to solve this, this, and this. She was really tough about my weight. She was, I mean, she was like one of those crazy 60s, like if you don't, if you don't lose weight, if you are fat, you no one will ever love you. And that was like expressly told multiple times where you're like just kind all of like, growing up your whole yeah. life. Oh, okay. So when I was starting to kind of, you know, like when puberty hit and I was kind of starting to gain weight, it was like she would pull me aside like she was giving me great advice. And it'd be like, now listen, you got to lose that weight and you will never. Take some of your cousin's heroin and drop <laughs> fucking 20, 30 pounds in a week. You know she's got crank in that SS Chevy Super Sport. You know there's crank in that glove box. <laughs> oh my God. So there was just those things. There was things where she couldn't let up on her idea. I remember her. She bought me a prom dress when I was a senior in high school that I loved. It was the nicest. Like, I tried on all the other shitty dresses, and then I tried on this dress at, like, fucking Nordstrom's or somewhere fancy, and it was really expensive. But it looked great, and then she goes, I'm going to get it for you anyway. She did one of those kind of things, and it was, like, a bonding moment, and we were, you know, finally getting along or whatever, and it was it was amazing. I mean, she splurged um, on it. And I remember when we were driving home, she goes, and you can wear it next year when you pledge sororities and you go to fraternity parties. And I like, I almost lost my mind. I was just like, cause at that point I had like cut my hair and dyed it black and done all the, I love the Smiths. And I'd done all those things to kind of outwardly show like, that's not my style at all. And she still, it was almost like, I bought you this dress and now you are going to join a, a sorority. It's where a it's sorority like, dress. No. Who's pledging <laughs> no. for a sorority and a prom dress? You, for like, well, you want me to go to a formal dance with a frat boy and his frat friends? That's I need three of y'all to bring my train <laughs> into the back right here. If you could do that, guys, I'm pledging. I'm pledging I'm Alpha pledging Phi, everybody. It's Alpha hell Phi. night tonight, guys. <laughs> Who's got my train? She wore the nicest dress and she drank the most Keystone. We have to have her in this <laughs> sorority. I was just like in the car going like, what are you talking about? I'm never going to do Like she had that way of, it was always just like you're not measuring up to this weird invisible beauty contest that was not fucking happening. And I would try to tell her like, mom, it's this, it's not 1965. We're not air hostesses like what are you doing yeah right it That's was that perfect. thing like yeah. she'd always go if you caught her we'd go to like a family party and you caught her across the room she'd go like this a little lipstick <laughs> always something always up. always you look like a corpse she used to look, always say you look like a corpse if you didn't have lipstick on so she was fucking tough like yeah. she was tough in her way i think it was like that that was her survival thing she knew like this is a commodity you you know you're a nurse and you have this job but you also need to land a man that's got a good job and you, this is how you earn it like it was all laid out very simply i think in that way for her so anything off the beaten path freaked her out and she didn't like it and she so she fought me on a lot of those things where i would just be like it's too late like i'm already like this and and you made me so fuck you yeah. like you if you didn't if you wanted me to be a proper lady you shouldn't have left me out in the fucking field for five hours every day. Like you, you give what you get or you get what you give. So yeah. And you're setting beds on fire and shit. You know what I love about that? I just thought about it is that your goddamn dad's a fireman. <laughs> <laughs> your mom's putting that shit out. Long distance. It's a long distance. Long distance. There was, there were things where like, I wonder. A I'm setting up a crew. <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm getting more insurance. <laughs> More sure. <laughs> I wonder if she threw those blankets away and just never told him. Because I know there was stuff I did where she was like, don't tell your father. Yeah, I'm sure. She would just be like, we don't want, we can't send this all the way up to the right, top. To the top. So she would cover for me sometimes. But I do think it was just that, you know, it was just like you, you, you leave children to grow wild every day after school and they're going to do they're it. They're going to grow wild. Yeah. I am um, going back to your mom. I had a, a friend of mine, um, she was 16 when she passed in a car crash. And um, 
I, I was talking to the doctor and I don't know why we got to talking about it. She was in, you know, on uh, life support and stuff. When we were talking about the soul, he was, we had a conversation about the soul and it was, he told me it was his belief. He's like, you know, everyone or most people say, you know, it's in the chest, it's here, your soul's here. And he said, I believe it's in the brain. And he said, the reason was because you can, I, they can put another heart in you lungs kidney they could put all this shit in you and you're still the same person but the moment something happens to your brain and you you said that it wasn't my mom anymore and that's that's why he's like i think that's where your soul is and i've always remembered that and i was like man it's it's if that's what the soul is all about then that's got to be true it is true you know and and also because we watched her yeah it she um you know, like what happens is you just start getting holes in your brain. Mm -hmm. And so people basically regress by like by decades. So there was a, you could mark time with her. She, so for a while she'd be like, um, at the dinner table, she'd say this all the time. She'd look to my dad and go, I think, I think it's time to go home. And my dad would go, we are home where that's where we are right now. And then she'd go, I know. And like to try to pretend like she'd always cover mm. and pretend that she knew. But after a while, um, she would be like, Jim, we have to like, she didn't know that we were her children and that oh. she wanted to go home because they were single newlyweds in San Francisco. And then there was a time where my sister was sitting on the it, couch. It was, with her. So she went, she would go back to memories of hers. Yes. That's interesting too. I, I say, I don't know a ton about it, I but that. You know, I've seen people don't know where they are or anything, but that's interesting to go back to a different place in time. Yeah, it was. That's how it was explained to us anyway, where it's kind of like it's as the, you know, brain is eroded or whatever. You're holding on to less and less of like the present and you're going back. So there was one point where my sister was sitting on the couch with her and my it, the thing was, she always knew my dad and she always asked for my for my dad, which was super fucking irritating because you could be there like, I'm here to be the good daughter and spend right, time yeah. with my mom. And she'd be like, where's Jim? Where's your father? And you'd just be like, oh, I, why doesn't anything count? No, everything about this <laughs> disease is so infuriating, yeah. so frustrating. But one time my dad walked into the kitchen and my sister, my mom looked at my sister and goes, who's that? <laughs> And That's she, cute, though. Isn't that the cutest? That is cute. And my Still sister told me that. Yeah, she was like, "Mom was super into dad in the kitchen today. Like that would have been her pick." Yeah. And it felt like they. She always had that with him. She was if he was there, she was okay, which was really lovely. But then also felt bad to us because then after yeah. a while, it's just like you're just watching someone leave. My mom's mom died of that, and I watched her and. There would be times where, and this is awful, but I would go and she lost so much weight. She got so small at the end and it was just a skeleton. It was, she was so frail and yeah. I'd go visit her in the hospital and, um, there would be times where I couldn't take it, you know? And I, I thought later too, like how fucking selfish of you can't take it. This poor person's dying. But also I knew she didn't even know who I was and she yeah. didn't know if I was there for 10 minutes or 10 hours. Yes. And I would go and, and always hug and kiss and say something and. And then, yeah, it got to the point where she didn't even know what was going on. And yeah. And she, yeah, passed quickly after that. And I think, like, it's just people say that a lot of times, like, you're being selfish or whatever, but it couldn't be further from the truth because the people who are connected to the people who are sick are the ones that suffer the most. My mom didn't know. There was one time she came downstairs. <laughs> she came downstairs wearing a fleece in her underwear with sunglasses on her head. And she was like, <laughs> just the top. and there was people in the living room and we're just like oh no what <laughs> y'all see my surfboard Seriously, <laughs> she had no idea and then she was like well what are you two up to or like what's going on in here and we're like mom like there were a bunch of those but yeah. we were embarrassed so we were going oh my god like my mother wouldn't leave the house without like the perfect scarf around her neck coming downstairs like in a fleece and old underwear was just like never ever never, happening yeah so it was that it was all our impact it was all our suffering and she was you know there were definitely times i know she was suffering but like that is intermittent i think and it's so much harder for the people around that are just like trying to fucking keep it together it's awful it's the worst fucking disease it is the worst it's terrible um can we talk about drinking please so <laughs> can we drink you can drink <laughs> what at what you said you started drinking early yeah who got you into it why did you get into it and what happened um well 
I mean, it was in our family. Everybody drank. It was it was a drinking family, drinking culture. Um, but I think, yeah, it was just watching everyone around me. And it wasn't like an idea that I had. It was all right there. And like my cousins drank underage. Um, it was like the kind of thing where like Thanksgiving, you know, it some aunt or uncle's house in the city, there would be teenage cousins stealing beers and bringing them downstairs. Yeah. So that was just kind of, it was just kind of like, I knew it was always on the horizon for me that I was going to have some fun when I turned, like when I got into high school or whatever. Um, but I remember in junior high, my friend, the same Holly Gardner, my friend who I also auditioned <laughs> to, uh, for Oliver with, she and I were like, I was like, let's drink wine coolers one day after school. Like I just wanted something to go on, like something to happen that was fun. I, didn't I just wanted to have fun and I wanted to be wild. I think I wanted like to stir up trouble, really. So, but serious drinking started freshman year, I would say, just wherever I could. You and know, what's serious find drinking it. then? Like a daily weekend? Oh, no, like weekends, but. But, but when, when there, the opportunity arose to drink, it would be drinking until I was blackout drunk or drinking whatever was in front of me or whatever Anything. anyone gave me. Yeah. It was and I just, imagine if you guys get it, you're out in those fields, you can get away from people all the time drink yes. until you want to drink. Absolutely. Yeah. There, and there was always people whose their family, somebody in their family was gone or like you're saying, there was like property where you could just get away. Yeah. We would do field parties. Yes. We had that except for. So my parents moved into this house when I was, um, I think, a junior or a senior in high school. And it was in town. So all of my life, we were five miles out of town, couldn't get cable TV, couldn't get pizza delivery, like just backwoods, it felt like. And then senior year, we moved in, into town and across, somebody gets the idea in our class, oh, there's this drinking rock. We're going to go drink at the rock. Well, the rock. Yeah, we had a rock too. Did he, yeah. It's like everyone we just did. goes and sits on yeah. a rock. Three cornfields behind Denny's, <laughs> and there's a rock right there. Meet you there. Yeah. Bring your parents cream to mint. Um, so yeah, you guys were drinking whatever, huh? Anything. A lot of like mint-based schnapps. Yeah, we had the schnapps and the <sighs> wine coolers and. I loved wine shit coolers. Beer. I did too, actually. That was a good. That was a good way to start. Yes. It was a good transition into alcohol. It's like, do you like Seven Up, <laughs> and do you like getting fucked up? Get over here. Come on. There's two old guys on a porch. They'll That's sing right. you a song two about it. Two old hillbillies on a porch. <laughs> um, so the first time we went to the Rock, we drove to this. It was like up behind a, you know, a grammar school or something like that. It was up this hill. Whatever. We walk up this like service road. We all get to the Rock. And I look and I go, oh, I can see my parents' house from here. And we would go and drink on this rock and fuck around and run around this field or whatever. Well, about five years later, like when we were out of college, my sister goes, oh yeah, we could hear everything you guys were saying out there. Like the way the our house was and the way, it was just across this ravine, you know what I mean? It was like yeah. a big thing like that with an oak tree at the bottom. But the, it carried perfectly because there was nothing else going on. So my sister goes, we would open the back door and just listen to you guys. <laughs> and hear everything you'd say. <laughs> and I didn't know, like, I was like, they don't know where I am and they don't know mm -hmm. what I'm doing and I'm living my best life or whatever. And it was, we were just completely, we were like TV for them on, on like Friday nights. <laughs> it was ridiculous. Um, yeah, so that's, but but not that many people in my um, class drank. A lot of the girls in my class were like, I'm trying to get into Stanford. So they'd be like, I'll be the designated driver. Like everybody else was kind of like low key. And me and my friend Christine, I had a couple friends that were just like, I'm like, you'll drink this Jägermeister with me though, right? I mean, we gotta, we gotta get out of here yeah. was my attitude all the time. Um, so yeah, so it just went like that. And then into college, I was so miserable in college. I just hated, I went to Sac State in Sacramento and hated it so much that I just tried to be, that's when the Keystone years really kicked that's in. That's when the Keystone kicked in, prime Keystone years. You know, they made those, they lined the cans and that's when I What did they line, what do you mean? Some, don't you remember Keystone beer? It was like part of the freshness. I remember Keystone, Keystone light. I remember yeah. that commercial, yeah. They tried to say that the cans of beer were fresher than others because they had lined them with something. That was their bullshit. They yeah. sold us all. You don't remember that any of that? No. It totally worked on me. I was like. They lined them, what, and the beer would stay colder, longer <laughs> like a or something? A little garbage can. It looked like a little garbage bag. 
just weird <laughs> beer bullshit that I fell yeah. for. Um, yeah. And that just kind of like, that was, I don't know, it was a weird escape. I was just really unhappy. I was a theater major at, like, at Sac State, and I just had that feeling of like, this, none of this is going anywhere. Um, and I deep down wanted to do stand up, but I just knew I would, like, didn't have the guts, essentially. And then by chance, I met a guy who was a stand up who ran the one, like, basically showcase show in that wasn't at um, Laughs Unlimited. So there was two clubs, Laughs Unlimited, Laughs Unlimited, and Citrus Heights. But the that punchline wasn't there then? Punchline wasn't there. Okay. So this was like, or this was early, early 90s. Um, and I just happened to be drinking at the same bar one night as this guy who my friend who I was there with had gone to grammar school with. And so he and I started talking. And then at one point he goes, are you a comic? And I was like, so thrilled. But I was like, no. And he goes, well, you should be. And then that was this like, cause I'd already flunked out of college. So I was like, this is what I'm gonna do. This is how I'm gonna like get it back and prove that I'm not a loser. So I, sta I started doing stand up in, in Sacramento. And did you flunk out of college because of the drinking? Yes, be yeah, because I didn't. You just didn't go to class. You just fuck it off. Is yes. that what happened? Yeah. yeah, I was there, and um, I just realized slowly but surely realized like if I don't go to class, no one's going to do anything. I, you don't get in trouble. No one cares. Yeah, you just um, waste your money. Yeah, but it wasn't my money. Right. But I had no, absolutely no appreciation of how much money it took for to get me there. What anything i was just like oh i'm just gonna stay in bed oh i'm just gonna drink that beer and it just all became um yeah i just loved fucking off and not not doing what i was supposed to do um i remembered there was a girl in our dorm the same year as me who started college and then she ran up like an 800 dollars phone bill because her boyfriend was in like the marines or something on the east coast and she just called him and like sat on the phone every night because she hated school so much. And then she ended up dropping out and everyone in the dorms was like, what a loser. And then I was like, what a loser. But inside <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, that's what I want to do oh, so bad. Man, that's my hero. Fucking get out of here. Um, so how do you stop drinking? What stopped it for you? How do you get out of that? You, and how you, long were you in? I was in until I was 27. So... Okay. Um, all the way through my f kind of formative comedy years, um, which I was good. It was like, you know, there was always a party. There was always, there was always drinking to be done, especially in San Francisco at the time. I'll bet. Jesus. When I moved to San Francisco, it was, you know, it was a party group. It was like Greg Barrett, um, Patton, Blaine, Brian Posehn, um, Laura Milligan, like all the people I hung out with, everybody was just serious. And then my friends, um, that I lived with, we all just, that's all we wanted to do. That's my favorite thing in the world was a Budweiser tall boy, like after my shift at the Gap. At the Gap. <laughs> you know, when you really want to crack yeah. one open because you've just Post -gap. folded. Post-Gap, yeah. No. You've folded so many sweaters that you've earned it. Um, so then I moved to LA and uh, I moved to LA when I was 24. So when I was 27, it was essentially like I'd just started having weird things. And I, so I've told you this story on some other podcast, but essentially I was like, I would fall down. Like we'd all be walking out of a bar and I would just fall down. And people would just be like, you're so klutzy or stop wearing those shoes or whatever. Um, but it was a blackout. It was, it was like I was just on the ground. But I never put it together because I was always super drunk. So I was just like, <laughs> I'm just me and my severe alcoholism <laughs> um, <laughs> so so then uh it escalated to where i was waking up on the ground um in the morning in the morning in the morning i would wake up next to my bed and i started waking up with bitten tongue and um i also one i remember very clearly one night having a dream that i was a spinner dolphin like coming up out of the water doing this. Uh, That's back which, to those flipper days. Yeah, <laughs> for real. Mm -hmm. He was with me it always. All ties back. Flipper, flipper. Also, best theme song. Had a good theme song. He really did. haunting, yeah. almost. A song by a dead child. Did you know that? No. What do you mean? <laughs> oh, is that not real? <laughs> nope, it's not real. <laughs> so, uh, uh, 
Okay, so <laughs> then the one morning, we, it all took a turn when the one morning I woke up and my tongue was super bitten as usual, whatever. I'm all hungover, immediately light a camel light. It's, smoking, it's so crazy how common and like just everywhere smoking was. Back everywhere. Then. Everywhere. Everywhere. And I would smoke in this studio apartment like just sit up in bed with like a bed made of laundry, <laughs> dirty laundry, and just like sit up and smoke a cigarette. And I remember calling my friend and being like, God, my tongue is so bitten, it's so crazy. I'm bite biting my tongue in my sleep. And then I turn and look at the wall behind me next to the bed and there is a spray of blood across it, huge. And I am just sitting there and my friend's like, anyway, did you see that guy I was talking to last night? And I was just like frozen looking at this <laughs> fucking display of blood. And I was just like, uh-huh. And I just went and get a sponge and just washed it off the wall. What and do you think you did? You just bite and spray? What do you, is that what you yeah. think you do? Just spit it all you, over the place? Yeah, when you have a seizure, you're just biting. You bite well, you're down You're having like seizures. That. Yeah. That's what was happening. Ah, that's what I the, think you did tell me before. It maybe you did, yeah. Yeah. So you, that's why you're waking up on the floor. You're, yes. you're coming. You're falling out. Of the, you were in the bed, or you never made it to the bed, or you don't know. Oh, sorry, because I'm combining this with drinking. But yeah, and that's why it was hard to like figure out in the beginning because I was always attributing it to being drunk. You're right. But I was seizing and falling on the floor, and the the. But was it related to alcohol? Well, they thought it was. Right. I mean, I'm sure it was because I know a lot of people that drunk black out and they don't have seizures. Well, but I also was taking the Chantix. <laughs> <laughs> don't take if you're an alcoholic. Could cause blackouts and seizures. Um Chantix will kill you. <laughs> but it, use it. It could actually. Um uh no no, it I was taking uh, diet pills, Fen Fen, which was like the big thing in the 90s. I, I remember hearing how terrible that was. It was very, very bad, very bad for you. And I Tab. <laughs> you weren't supposed to drink Tab either, yeah. And certainly not in combination. No, God, no. Um, but I was taking it before it was Fen Fen when it was just the upper Fen. So Fen Fen was a cocktail of upper and downer because the upper was so fucking strong that they had to start um, prescribing a downer to go with it so that you weren't just like screaming at the top of your lungs all day. But I was there, I was an early adapter. So I was just there for plain old Fen. When it was, I was a lunatic every day. I mean, I never slept. I, I never stopped talking. I was never not on the phone on like the cordless the cordless phone at the kitchen table, like yeah. fucking rolling calls and being like, rolling where's your show tonight? <laughs> then we're gonna meet at El Compadre. <laughs> it's dinner and drinks at six, like every day. Yeah. Calling everybody to let everybody know what the plan was. And I just kind of backed that right up to having these experiences where I was like dropping and I was like, these crazy platform shoes, I have to stop wearing them. Everything I could kind of explain away of why it was happening. So then like the spinner dolphin thing later on, I was like, Oh, that's because I was just flipping circles in bed, essentially. I see. Um, and landing on the floor and the biting. So once that... So just from, not just, but from the biting and then the seizing, you're spraying the wall. Oh, my God. Mul multiple sprays. Oh, my God. It was, it was one of the most disturbing things that I kept to myself. I was just like, well... Now it's an Instagram story. Yeah. <laughs> now, now I would I would already have a film deal if it <laughs> yeah, was would. fucking these days. You You're would. like, um, so I just wiped it off the wall and didn't say anything, and basically then started having what my aura is, which is the beginning of how you know you're about to have a seizure. Is my eyes start looking up to the left like that? This uh, goes back to your being blind days. <laughs> See, it all ties back. Is this God punishing me <laughs> for mocking the blind? Well, I would like to say imitating the blind. Imitating. Not You're mocking, imitating. but definitely trying to steal some of their thunder for sure. Um, and you would feel that? You would feel the look up to the left, you said? Yeah, because I wasn't choosing to do it. They, it was just happening. So it was suddenly like as and, if you were real interested about what was happening over there. But Right. And how long between that looking up and you blacking out do you even know? Do you have enough time to sit down? Do you have enough time yes. to? Yes. So it's usually, that would be the indicator that like something's going on. And then, but I never had seizures um, unless I was in bed. So I had them, they were like, they would brought on by sleep and like changing the, um, I don't know, REM 
Mm -hmm. whatever the situation was in my head. I'm not a doctor and I've never said I was. You did. You've um, not once said that. <laughs> but essentially it was that. So mine would always, I would get auras and then nothing would happen. I'd be like, that's weird that I'm looking around against my own will and then just not deal with it. Um, until uh, my friend stayed with me one night and it was this studio apartment. So she was sleeping on my couch and I was on my bed four feet away over here. Um, and she thought she woke up cause she thought I was choking to death and she flipped uh -huh. on the lights and I was having a seizure and my lips were blue and I was just like out completely out and not still breathing. holding a cigarette. <laughs> 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 uh, trying to smoke, biting off the filter, <laughs> holding it up real high away from my, holding it away. Away from I've my... <laughs> set beds on fire before guys. Don't worry. Yeah, believe me, this is a dangerous situation. <laughs> Um, yeah, so so I was having grand mal seizure, and that's what had been happening, but I was alone, so I didn't know. So the, for the first time, somebody was actually there. So she called 911, and I know I've told you the story, because this is a story where I wake up, I went to bed, and I could feel the eye thing happening. And I'd got, it, I went to bed really late, but I hadn't drunk that night. I'd gotten into a fight with the guy that I was dating, and I just left Largo and didn't say goodbye to anybody and just was like, oh, fuck you, and fuck you, and left. Went to bed. As I was like falling asleep, I could feel the eye pull thing, but it wouldn't stop and it was pulling really hard. And then I could feel my head going. And then I just thought to myself, this is bad, calm down and wait it out. Cause I could tell something really bad was about to happen. And then the pulling was really intense. And then I just was blacked out. The next thing I knew I was sitting up in bed and there was two insanely hot LAPD, LAFD firemen sitting on my bed with me. And I was only wearing a Dodgers t-shirt. And they were like, hi, do you know your name? And I was like, it's Karen Kilgariff. And they're like, do you know what day it is? And my, my joke always is that I was like, is it hot fireman day? <laughs> 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 Literally just like thighs out. It was horror fucking fire. Got my Fernando Valenzuela <laughs> jersey on, guys. Hey, do you like baseball or anything? It was, I wanted to die. Also, this apartment was like, it was just like one big litter box. It was just awful. There was like a cat. Everything about my life was a fucking like white flag. Someone please help me. Um, so basically they were like you're fine and you, you probably don't want to have to pay for an ambulance ride tripped over 27 keystone coming in <laughs> but other than that you're okay but you're fine yeah you're yeah. fine you're fine in this moment you had a party here <laughs> no i live by myself no it's always a party with me <laughs> uh, so for, um yeah so my friend basically drove me to cedar sinai they found out i didn't have insurance and they were like thanks so much why don't you head on down to ucla ucla Just harbor you? oh yeah wow um booted me to the chantics of hospice <laughs> for real have yeah. you been there i have been there it is tough yeah i was in a room with five other people no i haven't seen anything like that yeah it was it was almost like how they set up emergency rooms where everyone just has the curtain around them right i i had there was five other people this woman in the corner was dying of cancer she was like it was her last days oh. and her family just stood around her crying all day and night then there was a lady across from me that every once in a while that curtain would be open and we'd just be like that weird stare. What are we doing? I, yeah. I was just like, what am I doing? My mom showed up and she was like, I didn't remember her being there at first. And then like the first morning I woke up in the Harbor hospital, she was just sitting next to me. Like, like what the fuck? Cigarette, right? There. Yeah. I mean like <laughs> cigarette attitude, the Benson and hedges stare. Benson and hedges. Yeah. Weren't those the thin ones? No, those are, I think you're thinking like Virginia Slims. Maybe, yeah. Benson yeah. and Hedges were the really long ones. That's it, long. If green, you had really good green nails. Green pack or something. I feel like one of my friend's mom smoked those. Yes, they were. The Always pack lipstick was like, on the end of that yes, thing. Yes, yeah. iridescent brown, tannish green. Oh, tan, okay. Yeah, yeah green. Tan, I remember a green in there. Yeah. Well, she might have smoked menthols. You might be on to something. <laughs> so she was there super bummed out, of course, just of like what? What are you doing? What have you been doing? Like, what is this? I remember she actually took me in to take a shower one day, like, cause I was there for four days. So second day she was like, you need to take a shower. And I got in the shower and then she saw my, I have a tattoo of a salmon on my back that I got when I was completely shit face drunk, insisted. 
And then the next day was just like, what's this about? Like, <laughs> what's this story for? I like never wanted, I don't care about salmon in any <laughs> meaningful not way. Sale, but... Not a fisher, <laughs> not, don't even like to eat it. But I sure do have a tattoo of it on my lower back. Um, and my mom saw it and goes, we're not gonna tell your father about the tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> she was just like, what the fuck is wrong with you? And that's when I stopped drinking. Wow. Yeah. So, and that was good. I was 27. At the time, it felt like my life was over. I mean, it felt like I had failed myself right down, like down and out. Couldn't drive for three years um, because you have to make sure your seizure right. medicine yeah. controls your seizures. Uh, yeah, it was just like real kind of bottom of the barrel. And they, my parents really wanted me to move home because I didn't have a job at the time. There was nothing going on. I wasn't getting like auditions or I'd a couple times gotten like jobs here and there, like little like two line parts on TV shows and stuff, but nothing big, especially after Mr. Show. And they were just like throwing the towel, like it's time. Um, but I wouldn't do it. So I was just like, no, I, I will be out of your hair momentarily. Like, just let me get back on my feet. And then very soon after that, I basically just kind of like focused on it a little bit of like, what am I actually trying to do? And it was, I don't, I like, I hate, auditioning i hate I too. being in front of the camera i just don't you're doing what you're supposed to be doing look look at you yeah exactly you're a fucking boss <laughs> i'm a long way you're a boss mm, yeah thank you're you. doing awesome thank you well we're at that time uh thank you for being here thank of you course. for being so goddamn funny and open and honest my um, pleasure <laughs> will you again one more time social media anything you want to promote the network all that stuff your jets um, network our the jets v sharks network is it's called exactly right media and we are premiering a podcast called jensen and holes the murder squad on monday you said this comes out monday, monday. so today um, and that's a big kind of new true crime podcast um, that Billy Jensen, who's a true crime reporter, and Paul Holes, who's the guy that um, essentially solved the Golden State Killer. Oh, okay. Um, he's a uh, a cop or a retired policeman, and so they're working on cold cases using audience help. Um, so we're very excited about that. That's great. Yeah. yeah. That's uh, yeah. I think that's my big plug. All right. Well, thank you again. I love you. I love You're you too. You're fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I am Ryan Sickler on all social media, ryansickler.com. We'll talk to y'all next Monday.